And so again, see many of you who are familiar, some um, who aren't. So uh, I'm Gus Skorberg. I'm assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Guelph, where I'm also the academic co-director um, with Graham Taylor of the Center for Advancing Responsible and Ethical AI, for which this um, talk is, is a part of. Um, and so because it is the first um, talk of the year, I thought I can just give a little bit of a background for folks who are new and provide some updates for, for those who aren't. Um, so Care AI integrates ethics governance and social responsibility with technical leadership. And we have researchers affiliated with our center that come from every college across the University of Guelph's campus. Um, and we have three uh, core pillars that, that, that all of our affiliated faculty work in, AI methodologies, AI applications, and AI responsibility. And um, so in terms of the work of the center, um, we offer seed funding for early stage research projects for anyone working in one of these three pillar areas. Um, we schedule some you know, great talks through the seminar series and we provide lots of opportunities for folks from across campus to collaborate on any um, AI and, and ethics of AI kind of um, related issues. And so um, by way of update, um, I guess for two years now, uh, Care AI has been associated with and affiliated with the collaborative specialization in artificial intelligence um, with that graduate program. And we're excited to announce uh, this year um, new in 2021, the University of Guelph uh, is welcoming their inaugural cohort from students in the Masters of Data Science. And perhaps some of them are, are here today. Um, and uh, hopefully looking forward to fall 2022, uh, also adding to the slate a new philosophy specialization in, in the philosophy of data science, which will uh, be in the orbit of, of Care AI as well. Um, so we encourage students and faculty affiliated with these programs to, of course, attend these talks, but um, they are open to the, the larger community as a whole. Um, so the last plug I'll make here is that if you are, you know, a grad student or a faculty member and, and interested in becoming uh, involved, an affiliated faculty member, or looking for collaborators, you can reach out to myself or to Graham or to Farah, and we can sort of make the uh, appropriate connections. Um, and so, um, Graham, I see you're on. Is there anything else you wanted to, to add to that before uh, jumping over to the talk? No, that's perfect. Sorry, it's a couple late, minutes late joining up with another Zoom session that happened immediately before. But Aaron, it's it's wonderful to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. And also, uh, it's wonderful to see everybody at the seminar uh, after a little bit of a summer hiatus. So um, definitely uh, looking forward to today and uh, the remainder of the seminar series. Great. Well, thanks, Graham. Um, OK, so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to introduce our speakers. So. Um, uh, Aran Tal is associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at McGill University, and uh, very relevant for our purposes, of course, holds the Canada Research Chair in Data Ethics. Uh, at McGill, Professor Tal is also associated with the Institute for Health and Social Policy, as well as the Department for the Social Studies of Medicine. Uh, he received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto and has held, uh, you know, in, in philosophy, what, what I regard as some of the most prestigious fellowships, uh, including a Marie Curie Research Fellowship at Cambridge and an Alexander von Humboldt Postdoc Fellowship in philosophy. So um, Professor Tall is a very natural fit uh, for our seminar series here at Care AI because his work has made important contributions to both um, conceptual and theoretical issues, as well as more applied issues that are, are relevant to machine learning and AI. So some of his recent grant funded projects, um, for example, have included work on the conceptual foundations of psychometrics, and he's involved in a really cool project on uh, the measurement of well-being and, and how to use the tools from measurement theory to apply uh, to problems of well-being. And his latest project um, draws on his established expertise in the philosophy of science and proposes a novel approach um, to data ethics centered around his notion of responsible measurement. And, and so we'll hear a bit about that today, I imagine. Um, so it's my own view that um, a deep grounding in history and philosophy of science is often lacking in many contemporary discussions of AI and, and machine learning ethics. Um, and so um, that's why I'm very excited to, to hear this talk today. I think the perspectives um, that Professor Tall brings and, and specializes in are much needed in the area of AI ethics. And so um, that's why I'm very excited to introduce him today. And so we'll hear his talk entitled Accuracy and Fairness in Machine Learning lessons from measurement. And so with that, Aran, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Gus, uh, for this extremely kind introduction. And thanks, uh, Gus and Graham, uh, for the kind in in um, invitation to speak uh, at Care AI. Um, I'm very excited about um, what, what both of you are, are doing uh, at, at the University of Guelph. Um, 
the, the kind of initiatives both in research and in, in teaching and curriculum development uh, that you're describing are extremely exciting. And uh, I also want to thank uh, everyone who uh, was attending this talk. Um, as Gus mentioned, the title is uh, Accuracy and Fairness in Machine Learning, and the subtitle is Lessons for Measurement. And this is very much a work in progress based on um, my studies in the philosophy of measurement and some more, more recent uh, studies um, into machine learning. Uh, this is the fruit of, of my continued thinking about how these two fields could learn from each other. Uh, and let me start with uh, a cautionary tale uh, that's pretty old for a machine learning tale because it starts in, uh, in the mid 90s when uh, computer science Rich Karana, now in, at Microsoft, was part of a team at Carnegie Mellon where were they developing uh, machine learning algorithms to inform hospital admission decisions uh, for pneumonia patients, which is very important uh, because a pneumonia patient, um, if uh, sent back home as a, a, and, and treated as an outpatient, uh, uh, could develop uh, symptoms and their, their, um, their uh, situation could deteriorate quite quickly um, and, and lead to, to uh, death. Um, so uh, doctors are, are it, it's important for, for, for the medical care to be able to distinguish those pneumonia patients that are at higher risk and, and uh, admit them to hospital as, a, as an inpatient. Um, and uh, Karana's, uh, Karana developed a neural net that had a pretty good accuracy uh, for the uh, labels in, in his data set that told him, uh, you know, given about 14,000 uh, patients at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, which which of them died and which which of them survived? He was able to predict that with a an area under the rock curve of uh, uh, 0.86. That's a one one common measure of accuracy for machine learning. Um, so that sounds good. Uh, but another uh, learning algorithm that um, developed by his same team uh, using the same data uh, that's a rule-based learning algorithm uh, learned a suspicious rule. It learned the rule, and this is a rule it learned from the data, that having asthma lowers your mortality risk as a pneumonia patient. Um, and you may uh, guess why that is. Uh, the reason is that um, Asthmatics who, are, who presented with pneumonia were admitted directly into into the ICU. So, uh, if you if you have pneumonia symptoms and you're asthmatic, uh, doctors will Im immediately send send you for intensive care. Would they they would give you aggressive uh, uh, treatment that reduced your risk of dying lower than the general patient population. So, in the data that Rich Karana, Rich Karana was, was training his, his algorithm on, um, if you had asthma, your risk of dying was lower uh, than, than other pneumonia patients. Uh, that means that um, releasing this algorithm, treating, using this algorithm to, to predict the risk in, of, of uh, dying from pneumonia and making decisions about uh, uh, hospital admission uh, would, would pose a real risk to asthmatics. Uh, it would disadvantage them, would discriminate against asthmatics. And um, in this case, uh, the team realized this and decided that, that the neural net, although accurate, was too risky uh, for use on real patients. Now, this is interesting because you may wonder uh, if whether the standard story I just told you that, that Rich Karana's model was accurate but somehow unfair whether that's a good story. Um, was it that the, the algorithm was accurate, but just uh, unfair? Or could we say that it was unfair because it was in some uh, 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 different notion of accuracy, uh, it was inaccurate. Um, it, it predicted something that doctors didn't care about. Uh, and had it been used, it, it would have um, it would have given the, the wrong predictions. 
uh, for, uh, for patients. So an algorithm that gives you wrong predictions, uh, that sounds like an inaccurate algorithm. So what's going on here? Um, there is a literature on algorithmic fairness that is very widespread um, um, that treats fairness as equality of groups with respect to benefit of, or harm. Um, you want an algorithm that is, is uh, informing high stakes decisions, uh, such as about hospital admission, but also about things like hiring uh, um, um, candidates for a job or, um, or um, informing bail uh, decisions in, uh, in a criminal uh, uh, justice court or um, approving loans. You want these to uh, treat different um, segments of the population in, an, in a fair way. Uh, you don't want them to be biased against certain racial or gender groups and so on. Um, and there are various um, probabilistic criteria that this um, literature on algorithmic fairness has developed, um, such as demographic parity, um, under which the same fraction of group members receive a benefit or harm, or equalized odds where the um, where their error rates, such as false positives or false negatives, are equalized across group and groups and so on. Um, the, the, the thing I'm going to push against is this idea that problems of fairness um, are distinct from problems of accuracy. That, okay, we have an, an algorithm and it's, it's accurate, but we also have to uh, make sure that whatever benefit or, or harm this algorithm is used to dispense uh, is, is distributed fairly. Um, in this literature, um, and, and kind of in the influenced by this literature, many computer scientists now believe that there's a trade off um, between accuracy and fairness, that these, these two desiderata are, are somehow incompatible um, um, in principle. And, and these are just a couple of, the, of, of citations to, to papers that take that for granted. Um, what I'm going to argue today is that this view is a consequence of an overly narrow concept of accuracy and error that's used in machine learning. Uh, as an aside, I also believe that it's, it's a consequence of an over, overly narrow concept of fairness, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to focus on the notions of accuracy and error and, that are used in machine learning and the machine learning literature and ask uh, whether, whether those concepts are adequate for the purposes uh, that machine learning algorithms are currently used for. Um, and my, my central thesis are as, as follows. First, I'm going to argue that many of the problems associated with the application of machine learning, especially to high stakes decision making, um, that are currently classified as fairness problems are, uh, in fact, due to inadequate definition of target variables, of the variable that the, the algorithm is meant to predict. Uh, then I'm going to also try to convince you that such problems are as much accuracy problems as they are fairness problems. I'm not going to deny that they are fairness problems, but I'm going to uh, try to convince you that they are also accuracy problems. Uh, they need to be treated as accuracy problems, and they need to be reported to users and stakeholders as accuracy problems, not just as fairness uh, issues. And uh, furthermore, I'm going to try to convince you that metrology, metrology is the science of measurement, um, has helpful lessons and tools um, that, that machine learning uh, researchers could uh, fruitfully use to deal with problems of inadequately defined target variables, and therefore also solve many of the uh, problems that are currently classified under the fairness uh, rubric. I just want, as, an, as a kind of uh, disclaimer from the start, to, to say uh, this, is, this talk is not intended as an argument against using machine learning. Um, machine learning, uh, when used properly, uh, can be extremely valuable and useful. Uh, but it is intended as uh, suggesting various improvements uh, for the use of machine learning, uh, for the responsible application of machine learning um, to, to these high stakes. Uh, contexts. So what I'm going to do is first 
provide you with an analogy between machine learning models and measuring instruments. Um, and, um, and then I'm going to delve into what I consider to be the, the problematic uh, overly narrow concept of accuracy in machine learning that I call the label matching conception. Then I'm going to distinguish between three kinds of bias that, um, that become uh, clearer in light of the analogy between uh, machine learning models and measuring instruments. And that's label bias, modeling bias, and fitness bias. And I'm going to focus on fitness bias as the main uh, kind of bias that is currently neglected in machine learning literature. And I'm going to conclude with a few comments on what it means to measure responsibly uh, with machine learning. OK, so uh, part one, an analogy between machine learning models and measuring instruments. Um, my background is in philosophy of measurement. I've been, um, uh, I've been part of, of a growing community of philosophers, uh, historians, and scientists uh, working on the conceptual foundations of measurement. Uh, and you can see on this slide uh, a few recent books and special issues uh, that deal with the inferential structure of measuring, um, with the ethical and social impacts of different methods of measurement, and with the history um, of measurement and quantification in, in various fields. Um, so I, I urge you, if you're interested, to look up some of these, um, some of these sources. Um, the story of measurement starts uh, in antiquity, but since we don't have much time, I'm going to jump straight to the 19th century, um, when the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, the, the body that uh, standardizes me measurement worldwide, uh, was established. Uh, and in the late 19th century, uh, specifically in 1889, um, the meter and the kilogram were defined in terms of specific artifacts. Now here you see in this, in this picture, in this photo, uh, the, this, the international prototype of the kilogram. It's so precious that it had to be protected. So it's right here, it's this, this uh, metal cylinder uh, that's just four centimeters uh, uh, high. It has to be protected by these, in, inside these three glass jars because it's so sensitive to surface contamination. And this is a, the famous international uh, prototype of the meter. These, uh, these artifacts were very successful at the time uh, because relative to the, the, the balances and, and, uh, um, and ways of measuring uh, length that were available at the time, these objects were very stable. But they also posed a limit to how stable measurement could be. Uh, measurement could not be more accurate than the instabilities of these artifacts. Um, and since they do suffer from uh, changes with, with the interaction with the atmosphere, um, you need to clean them. And the cleaning process doesn't exactly uh, reproduce their, their mass or their length every time. Um, at some point, you you could start measure balances became more sensitive than the, the fluctuations of the international prototype of, of the kilogram. Um, and that's why metrologists uh, eventually abandoned these as the basis for measurement. Um, and this is a crucial point. Um, uh, stakeholders, the users, they don't really care about what stick or, or, or weight you keep in a vault in Paris. Um, what, if, if, I, if, I am, uh, if I manufacture car parts uh, in Canada, I want to know how their size in meters or millimeters. I don't care how many meter sticks of the sort you keep in Paris uh, fit across my, my car part. What I care about is whether uh, when I receive uh, a car part that was manufactured, say, in Japan, I want these two car parts to fit together. Um, I want their measurements to be comparable. The, the standards themselves are merely uh, tools for making sure that that comparability works. But um, at some point, comparability, um, it, comparability um, the requirements of comparability are, are uh, more strict than the sorts of instabilities that these artifacts allow. 
And this is why modern metrology um, today distinguishes between two uh, concepts. One is the concept of a definition and the other is realization. Uh, defining a measurement is providing a, an, an idealized, uh, a, a, linguistic, a linguistic specification of some idealized circumstances, um, conditions under which uh, we can fix the reference of a term. Whereas the realization of a measurement uh, is an approximate physical instantiation of the measurement as it is defined. Let me give you a an example, today the meter is no longer defined by that stick. It's defined by the length of a path traveled by, by light in vacuum during a time interval with this duration, which is uh, uh, just one over the speed of light um, in seconds. Um, this is just a definition. It's a, it's a linguistic entity. The definition itself it doesn't have a length. It, it specifies a length, but to realize the length, in the lab and to be able to compare anything to it, you need to build something. And in this case, it's a, uh, an example is a helium neon laser interferometer. That's just an approximation. Uh, the fringes of the interference of this laser do not precisely tell you what a meter is. They have some uncertainty. Um, another example is the second, which is defined as the duration of this many periods uh, of the radiation corresponding to a transition between two energy levels of a cesium atom. This definition is idealized. The, the cesium atoms in question are uh, in, a, in an unperturbed ground state. They're just floating there at zero Kelvin, no gravitational fields, no thermal background. Uh, that's of course physically impossible. Um, cesium fountain atomic clocks are one design of an atomic clock that tries to approximate these ideal conditions, but it cannot approximate them perfectly. What, uh, what metrologists care about uh, when they evaluate accuracy is not the realizations. The realizations are ways of getting to, um, um, getting to the definition. What they really care about is evaluating accuracy relative to the definition, relative to the ideal case. Let me give you an example. Uh, this is a cesium atomic clock, a cesium fountain atomic clock, one of 13 clocks uh, around the world that, um, that um, are used for uh, timekeeping. Um, every every uh, computer and, and, uh, and cell phone in the world is ultimately, the, the clock on these, on these devices ultimately calibrated against one of these. Um, so inside this machine are, are cesium atoms that are being uh, perturbed, uh, are, they're being probed and, and the frequency, the relevant frequency is being measured. But there are many uh, uh, influences, extrinsic effects that, um, that make the frequency deviate from the ideal uh, defined frequency. And that's where metrologists need to make what's called an, an uncertainty budget. They make a long list of each and every possible um, uh, extrinsic effect on these atoms, such as the effect of gravity, the effect of magnetic field, the effect of temperature, the effect of collision between cesium atoms, and so on. And with each of these physical effects, they uh, they predict how much of a of a of a, of a bias will be. Uh, will result in, in the output frequency and what the uncertainty is about this prediction. What I want you to notice is that uh, what they take to be the, the ultimate accuracy of the clock is the total uncertainty about the prediction, not the sum total of the corrections. Uh, what this means is that when a clock like this one, like, like this clock ticks, the the, the, uh, the correct uh, rate of tick is not that of the standard second. The correct rate of tick is uh, one that after these corrections, after these theoretical corrections, would give you the definition, the, 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 the defined frequency. Um, so what matters in the act for the accuracy of, of this clock is not uh, its actual ticks, 
the ticks it realizes, the frequency it realizes, but the frequency that it's that one can derive from its actual frequency using this uh, complex theoretical and statistical model. Uh, let me make this point more general. Um, what metrologists construct is what's called a calibration function. What they want to get is the frequency of some ideal process that is, is counterfactual. It, it cannot be, in fact, realized. Um, what they do have are indications, uh, ticks of clocks um, that are somewhat imprecise. And they also have a bunch of influence quantities. A calibration function is a function that takes the, the realization along with these extrinsic influences and gives you uh, an outcome, gives you the, the, the ideal case. And what we learned from this is that, first of all, a calibration function is a model-based prediction about the behavior of the measuring system. Now, um, a measurement outcome, which is the result of the calibration function is a model-based predictor of instrument indications under idealized theoretical and statistical assumptions. Uh, we, we think of measurement as something that gives us uh, directly observable facts, but uh, accurate measurement doesn't. What it gives you are the model-based predictors of the measurement process given some background assumptions. And Interestingly, this means that measurement accuracy is a kind of predictive accuracy. Measurement accuracy is the predictive accuracy of an idealized model of the measurement process. And to those of you who are familiar with machine learning, this is starting to sound a lot like what we do in machine learning. Um, so measurement, uh, accurate modern metrology, the way it models measurement processes um, is akin to the way um, supervised uh, machine learning algorithms are designed. So let's explore this uh, analogy in a bit more detail. Um, let's look on the one hand at measuring instruments and on the other at supervised discriminative uh, machine learning models of the sort used in say um, medical applications and many medical applications for diagnosis and resource allocation. Um, a measuring instrument interacts with some objects and the machine learning model interacts uh, indirectly with, with events and objects through the data set. A measuring instrument produces an indication and machine learning model produces classifications and scores that we call predictions. A measuring instrument, uh, when we measure, we use the indications to infer measurement outcomes through a calibration function. Well, we use that, we do that too in machine learning. We take the predictions and we use them to infer values of some target variable, such as um, risk of death or, um, uh, or, or, or risk of readmission. Um, measuring instruments are calibrated against reference standards of known qual quantity values and machine learning models, at least in sup under supervised learning, are calibrated against data sets with some trusted labels. So the, those are the, the bits of data uh, that, um, that the predictions will try to replicate. And finally, uh, measuring instruments are, are, um, um, require a calibration function and calibration function is derived from statistical and theoretical models. Uh, and here machine learning uh, models are a little different. Model parameters or weights are not derived theoretically um, but are adjusted automatically uh, through, through a machine learning uh, algorithm. And uh, I, I think uh, um, Alex uh, Muskung is, is here, uh, and I know he's working on, uh, um, on, on, on exactly this kind of analogy between calibration and th these two cases. So I'm, I'm happy to see you here. Um, okay, so we have this grounds to think that there's something analogous going on inferentially between the inferential structure of measuring and the inferential structure of, of, um, of uh, modeling with a machine learning model um, under supervised learning. Uh, so what? And here comes part two, what I call the label matching conception of accuracy in machine learning. Um, let's, let's look at a more recent example um, 
machine learning for detecting heart disease. Um, machine learning algorithms uh, are widely used for predicting heart disease, and they're typically trained and tested against hospital records, um, where the labels tell you uh, uh, what the diagnosis was. Uh, the accuracy and error are, are typically uh, evaluated directly against those labels. Uh, in this case, um, this study from 2019 used the Cleveland data set where the label uh, is uh, positive, is a positive diagnosis if, if the cardiologist observed the narrowing of 50% or more in the diameter of any major coronary vessel based on an angiogram, that's a heart x-ray, and zero otherwise. Um, and you see that accuracy here is the is simply the percentage of correct predictions from among all the predictions. And whether a prediction is correct is simply whether the prediction matches the label, right? If the model predicts one and the label is one, then there's an agreement. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's a dis if there's a disagreement, it, it counts an, as an error. Um, and there are more uh, complex ways to, to measure. There are more complex performance uh, measures for accuracy that I, one of them I already mentioned, the area under the rock curve. And, and there are others um, such as uh, sensitivity and specificity. They all share the same structure, uh, the same assumption that accuracy is label matching. And an algorithm that um, gets uh, that replicates all the labels in the test data set uh, precisely is 100%, would have 100% performance under all these measures of performance. Uh, but there's something wrong here. Um, and that's, um, that's the mismatch between what the model is predicting and what the target variable is. The target variable is the, the presence of heart disease. Right? That's what we want to predict. But what we end up predicting in this case is not the presence of heart disease. It's the presence of a heart disease diagnosis. Uh, and diagnosis is not prevalent. We know that very well for many studies that show, for example, that, um, that women are underdiagnosed under with heart diseases. And there are many reasons why that, uh, that happens. Well, women uh, tend to get heart disease later in life. There's the, the, the symptoms they present are uh, different than, than men on average. Um, there is, there is a, especially in primary care, there is a, still a kind of belief that uh, women are less affected by heart disease. Um, the, um, the question here, okay, so we're predicting diagnosis, uh, but, uh, our, but we, we're, by predicting diagnosis, we're discriminating against women. Um, because our, our data set uh, already is, is based on the actual practices of diagnosis that are prevalent in medicine. Is this an accuracy problem or is this a fairness problem? Under a label matching conception of accuracy, it's not an accuracy problem. Because if, you, if your algorithm matches the labels in the data set perfectly, your accuracy is 100%. Um, it's, it, it is a, it's a fairness problem. Now we have to figure out how to maybe tweak the algorithm so that it um, it gives us a, a more a more fair distribution of of diagnoses. But by doing that, the common wisdom goes, we'll be degrading the accuracy of the algorithm. Um, we'd have to give up something in, in accuracy to gain something in fairness. That's that's the trade-off thesis. Uh, but the trade-off thesis is just uh, an artifact of this label matching conception of accuracy. Uh, let's go back to the, our analogy between measuring instruments and, um, and machine learning models. Me when you talk about measurement, remember, error is the difference between the outcome of an actual process, like the ticks of that clock I, saw, I, I, I showed you, and some ideal measurement process, a cesium, found, a, a cesium atom all by itself, unperturbed. It's the difference between the actual frequency and that ideal frequency that is the error. Uh, but in machine learning currently, error is simply a mismatch between uh, the, the prediction and the re relevant label. 
uh, it's not compared to any ideal scenario. It's just compared to prediction versus reality. Um, and something similar happens with accuracy. Um, modern metrology looks at accuracy as the total uncertainty associated with predicting error. It's how well we can predict the difference between the actual and the ideal that uh, constitutes accuracy. But in current practice in machine learning, accuracy is simply the absence of error, uh, the rate of matches between predictions and relevant labels. And this, to me, uh, is very reminiscent of 19th century metrology. Uh, we are, uh, in machine learning, we're still thinking about error and accuracy, much like uh, metrologists thought about error and accuracy um, in the late 19th century when they, when they thought about accuracy as relative to some uh, actual concrete artifact, where they had to reproduce whatever, um, uh, whatever uh, result, uh, some concrete procedure, such as counting meter sticks or, or comparing um, masses on the balance uh, provided them. That's how they thought about accuracy is the, the reproduction of some concrete operation, the result of a con con concrete operation. Metrology has, um, uh, has gone beyond this and, and for the better of, of stakeholders, for, for the benefit of stakeholders who aren't interested in, uh, in any of these concrete artifacts, what they want uh, is something quite different. I'm going to argue that what they want is this. Uh, error in machine learning, uh, I think, should be conceived as the difference between the prediction of an actual model and its predictions under some ideal conditions. The predictions it would give under some counterfactual in some counterfactual scenario, and uh, accordingly, accuracy should be thought of uh, as the total uncertainty associated with predicting error, just like we we do with clocks. So, how do we do this? The way to do this, I propose, is to first uh, ask and answer three questions um, about definition and about realization. The first question is. Which variable do the labels in my data set realize? Um, in, in our example, it's a reported diagnosis or uh, a reported death, uh, if we look at the, at the first example I mentioned. Next, which variable do machine learning uh, model outputs or predictions realize? Um, and, and in the heart disease example, the, the the variable being realized is a probability of a diagnosis, but notice that it's a probability of diagnosis under current medical practices. So given that women are underdiagnosed, for example, um, what, what, what's your chance of being diagnosed? Uh, that's what the, the model is in fact predicting. But then the question is also, the third question is, what is the definition of the target variable that best accords with stakeholders? holders' interests? What do they want to learn about? And they do not want to, in fact, learn about uh, the probability of diagnosis given that women are underdiagnosed. What they want to know is the probability of heart disease. Right? That's, that's the target variable that's of interest to them. And, and these two, notice that, that two and three are not the same variable. Uh, we need to somehow operationalize this third variable um, in a way that would align uh, with that, that would help us align what the model predicts with what stakeholders need. Uh, but stakeholders are interested uh, in the probability of a positive diagnosis, not under the real circumstances of, of uh, medical practice, but under idealized counterfactual scenarios where all patients are treated equally. Think again about, about these asthmatics. The, the doctor uh, that that decides whether you're going to stay in the hospital. Uh, they don't want to know your risk of death um, uh, under the, the ICU um, admittance protocol, right? They want to know the risk of, the, the risk of death from pneumonia, right? Uh, in, in, in a counterfactual scenario where all patients are treated equally, how, how bad is your pneumonia, right? Uh, they want to abstract away or idealize away all those interfering factors um, that influence your risk of dying, um, such as 
the the quality the differential quality of care you will receive right they that's not what they want um, okay so this leads me to a threefold distinction between label bias modeling bias and fitness bias um, those of you who are you know familiar with the machine learning literature may may think hey ron you you seem to be taking an overly opt overly pessimistic view of this field we we have been thinking a lot about our, the labels in our in our data set, uh, and we do know that the, that labels in the data set are uh, often not reliable. And indeed, that's true. Um, the, there is a a bias, a well known bias called sometimes called label bias between the the actual label and the intended label, between re reported diagnoses and actual diagnoses, between reported deaths and actual deaths. That's uh, perfectly true. But that is not my point. This is not the bias I want to emphasize in this talk. Um, and of course, another thing that machine learning researchers have worked on a lot is what I call modeling bias. Um, that's the difference between the, the intended label uh, and what the model in fact predicts. A lot of work in machine learning goes uh, into enhancing the, the accuracy of exactly, uh, exactly the, these predictions. Um, but notice that by, uh, by treating label bias, by, by minimizing label bias, and by minimizing modeling bias, our work is not done yet. Uh, the predictive variable by itself is not what stakeholders care about. It's not, in fact, the target variable. Um, it's, in our example, it's the probability of positive diagnosis given um, actual medical practice and, and with all its... Uh, um, in interfering influences. What stakeholders care about, like I said, is the risk of heart disease. That the that's the target variable. And fitness bias is the, um, is the difference, the distance between the predicted variable and the target variable. My main claim here is simply that the uncertainty about this difference, the difference between predicted variable and target variable, is part of model inaccuracy. It's not just other, some other problem of fairness for someone else to take care of. Um, it, it is part of your, your work uh, as the machine learning algorithm designer uh, to, to take this uncertainty into account and to report it to your users and stakeholders. So what exactly is fitness bias? Uh, it's a discrepancy between a variable, the variable a model predicts and the target variable it's intended to predict. Uh, when you know your fitness bias, you can correct it, and then your model becomes fit for purpose, which is why I call it fitness bias. Uh, another possible name I'm considering is uh, target specification bias, um, because it's a bias about the way you specify your target variable. Um, so, okay, so how do we do this? Well, we need information um, about the specific domain in which the, the algorithm will be implemented in order to correct fitness bias. Um, the information we need depends on the details of the implementation and the context, the, the social context, context, the institutional context. You have to know a, a lot about what happens in the hospital to be able to, um, to correct uh, the, the fitness bias of, of Rick, uh, Rich, Rich uh, Carana's model uh, or, or the, heart, uh, the heart disease model. This is not something that will be, um, that, that you can formalize um, a general, general solution to and apply it universally. Imperfect information about these domain specific features increases the uncertainty of your model predictions. And, and this should be reported to users of your, um, of your algorithm. Um, part, of the, part of the way forward, I think, is to start thinking seriously about how we not just define the target variable, but also how, how we operationalize the target variable. Given that we want to learn about the risk of heart disease, that's our target variable, uh, what kinds of factors do we need to take into account uh, that influence the, the, the difference between the predicted variable and the target variable? For example, one factor is that women are, tend to be underdiagnosed. Uh, 
Another factor is that women are underrepresented in clinical trials. And that if you have data from clinical trials, that may affect um, the, your fitness bias, the, the, the fitness for purpose of, um, of your machine learning model. Uh, but what about the fact that men at younger ages are more susceptible to heart disease? Which of these uh, should, should form part of your oper operational definition of your target? And which ones uh, should you idealize away? This, I argue, is a value-laden question. Um, you have to uh, decide, um, along with stakeholders, um, how exactly the target variable will, de be, will be defined based on what the stakeholders care about. For example, you could define um, uh, your target variable, you could, you could operationally define your target variable as the probability of positive diagnosis in an ideal scenario where women are neither underdiagnosed nor underrepresented in clinical trials. And then try to assess, given empirical data about uh, the rate at which women are underdiagnosed and um, the potential effects of inclu including women in clinical trials uh, on the data. Um, so both theoretical but also empirical data that is domain specific would, would be relevant here to assess fitness bias. But you may, for example, decide that this factor shouldn't uh, be idealized away, that the fact that men at younger ages are more susceptible is part of the phenomenon that you're trying to predict. It's, it's part of heart disease. It's not part of the social context, and therefore you should leave it in. Whether or not you should leave it in is a value judgment, and it depends on the purpose, on the, the kind of decisions that would be made um, in the context where you implement your machine learning. So um, how much fitness bias you have is is not some kind of there's no mathematical formula that would give you this this um, this number uh, uh, without considering some some uh, important human values, um, and that means that accuracy evaluation itself um, is a value laden and purpose relative task. Okay, um, how much time do I have, Gus? Uh, could you give me an estimate? Yeah, so about ten minutes, and that'll leave us about thirty for Q and A. Is that, does, that, does that work? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So at, at this point, uh, uh, you may think, okay, is all this just a matter of terminology? Is, is all around saying is that the thing we call uh, fairness before, now we need to start calling it accuracy, but does it really matter how we call it? I mean, we still need to fix it somehow. Um, and the answer is yes, it does matter. Uh, it's not just terminology. And it matters for three main reasons. One is, as long as we don't recognize that these uh, fairness problems are also accuracy problems, we will continue to um, overestimate the accuracy uh, of, of machine learning models that are, that are being delivered to, to users. Uh, just like um, uh, Caruana's model uh, claimed to be much more accurate than I think it, it, it should have. Um, had they not stopped and realized that this was risky, um, doctors could have easily believed that that this has that this really is uh, uh, you know 0.86 accurate um, when when in fact uh, it wasn't. Once once you compare it, once you uh, you use the standard uh, the, the counterfactual standard of uh, of mortality. Uh, under um, under equal treatment, right? Lot mortality under uh, disparate treatment. So we this is important. Uh, it's not just terminology. We need to to uh, uh, stop overestimating accuracy um, by using these very narrow concepts of accuracy. Uh, another important lesson is that machine learning researchers. Uh, tend to mistakenly believe that accuracy and fairness somehow trade off against each other. And it may be that in some cases they do, but as a general rule, there's no reason to think that we can't have uh, uh, algorithms that are both perfectly accurate or, or extremely accurate and extremely fair, or that increasing fairness necessarily uh, degrades accuracy. Um, 
if you take what I what I propose seriously, then that's no longer the case. And <clears throat> finally, um, there's a matter of a division of labor and the kind of institutional uh, uh, distinctions in within the field of machine learning that are at stake here. Um, there's a tendency by, by software designers in this field to leave the fairness questions to someone else. So I've made the, the algorithm as accurate as, I, as, as possible. Now, uh, for fairness, you know, give, give me some kind of a constraint on my model and I'll run it through my model. Uh, or, you know, take this model and explain to users what it does or doesn't. Or, you know, tell tell the company's lawyers or or some some ethics guy uh, uh, they can deal with the with the fairness issues here. Uh, I've done my share. Um, this I, I think this attitude is changing in in the machine learning uh, uh, industry. Uh, more and more uh, software engineers realize that um, it is part of their job to worry about uh, fairness. Um, and my point here is um, it, is to promote exactly this kind of uh, uh, responsible innovation and responsible uh, uh, design. Um, because if uh, many of the fairness problems in machine learning are accuracy problems, then they should be part of the problem statement that machine learning algorithm designers uh, have in front of them um, as, as the goal of their algorithm. Um, I'll quickly go through a few additional clarifications to my view. Uh, am I saying that fitness bias is a problem with the data? Um, no, not necessarily at least. It could be, but, um, but even if the data reflects reality perfectly, even if there's no label bias, if, even if Karana's data showed, uh, was perfectly reliable about uh, uh, mortality, uh, you would still have exactly the same problem. The problem wouldn't go away. Um, so you can have data that reflect reality perfectly, yet misrepresent the target variable. And that's because the target variable is not about reality. It's about an ideal. It's about a counterfactual, ceteris par paribus um, scenario. But hold on, is, is not the goal of machine learning to predict actual events? Uh, and my answer is no, at least not when you implement uh, machine learning in complex decision-making scenarios, uh, typically decision-makers, make uh, they require counterfactual predictors. They want to know what would happen in some, uh, in, in a case where everyone is treated equally, for example, uh, but in a world where people aren't treated equally, whether for good or bad reasons. Um, the thing is that decision-makers don't usually know that they want counterfactual predictors. They don't ask for them. Um, and computer scientists often don't give them, uh, don't provide them. Um, so uh, so the, the lesson here is that it is up to the machine learning designers to, um, to realize when they, when they specify the target variable that the target variable is, uh, is, a, is counterfactual and idealized. Um, so in the end, how do we evaluate the accuracy of counterfactual predictions? Um, that at first may sound impossible, but look, metrologists, they do it all the time. Remember the clock? The uncertainty associated with the cesium found in clock is the uncertainty of a, of a counterfactual uh, 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 prediction. Uh, what would the duration of the second be under the ideal conditions where the cesium fountain doesn't interact with anything. Um, um, the metrologists are able to answer questions like that because they, they use background theories, background information that is domain specific uh, in, in addition to auxiliary data uh, about their clock. Um, and the same is possible for uh, for the kind of medical um, implementations that I've been talking about with relation to machine learning. Um, you could use surveys of, of doctors or uh, you could use expert knowledge about the, the, the processes that happen in hospitals. You can use randomized control trials um, when it comes to uh, uh, examining the differential treatment doctors give, for example, 
uh, men and women. Uh, so there are many ways to, uh, to correct for fitness bias. The fact that it's a counterfactual prediction doesn't mean that we don't know um, its uncertainty. So let me conclude uh, with just uh, a few lessons, a few takeaway messages um, about what I think it would be a, a, a responsible measurement uh, paradigm for machine learning. And the first advice for responsible measurement is to think of machine learning models and analogously to measuring instruments. I'm not claiming that, you know, that machine learning models are measuring instruments uh, or that th these two are just the same or anything like that. But I think the analogy is, 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 has, a, has, a really has a strong potential to be fruitful. Um, learning from metrology can be a way for machine learning to develop a kind of methodological maturity. Uh, um, machine learning evolved from, uh, from questions about uh, data and, and statistics. Um, it, it, it evolved as an attempt to find patterns in data. Um, and, and it has strong relations with the, with the older tradition of what's called data mining. Uh, but now the, the social, the institutional context in which machine learning is, is operating is vastly different than it, it was decades ago. Um, uh, machine learning today is, isn't just finding patterns in data, it's producing evidence. It's producing evidence for decision makers. And if you're producing evidence for decision makers, I argue that you need to hold your methodology to a higher standard than you did if you're just looking for patterns in data. Um, and that's where uh, metrology provides a, a strong theoretical framework for how to treat evidence, um, uh, how to, um, um, to judge the quality of evidence to a higher standard. But my second advice is to specify the, the measurement or the, the target variable, the thing you want to, to predict according to the purpose uh, of, of the use and the, the concerns of stakeholders, and uh, not according to the labels that you have. Um, try to be more rigorous than your stakeholders, in fact. Your stakeholders may not think about the difference between the, the actual and counterfactual uh, definitions of the target variable. But you, the modeler, should, should do that thinking for them. That is, is a responsible kind of measurement. Um, third tip is to simply think of many, not all, uh, but many fairness problems as accuracy problems, at least potentially as accuracy problems. Uh, ask yourself, is this fairness problem uh, also uh, a, a symptom of, um, of misspecifying the target variable or, or of a gap between the way we've thought about the target variable and the way our stakeholders and user actually, users are actually thinking about the target variable. My fourth uh, 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 tip um, is to evaluate accuracy relative to a theoretical ideal, not relative to the data. Um, and if you don't have a theory uh, about how things happen, the dynamics, of, of, your, um, of your context of application, if you're, if you're trying to predict mortality, but you don't have a theory of how hospitals work, then something is missing from your model, very likely. Uh, and finally, my last prescription is uh, to make empirically informed domain-specific and value-laden judgments about accuracy. Um, this may seem like too much to ask of computer scientists. They already have to know how to optimize their models, how to calculate their loss functions. Uh, isn't it too much to ask uh, of machine learning um, um, uh, designers to, uh, to use value-laden judgments about the, the specific domain in, in which their algorithm will apply? My reply to this is that, uh, once machine learning becomes applied to solving human problems, machine learning is no longer 
a branch of computer science. Uh, machine learning is a branch of social science. And when I say um, that machine learning is a branch of social science, I mean social science in the broad sense of uh, in including health policy, law, management, uh, and, and other areas that involve human, human interactions and human behavior. Uh, we're in a transitional period in which uh, machine learning is still mostly understood and practiced by computer scientists. And this is part of what needs uh, to change. The, the design of machine learning uh, algorithms insofar as they're applied to solve human problems uh, uh, should be understood as primarily a social science uh, project that involves computer science method, that involves computational methods or statistical methods. Um, but, the, um, but those who design uh, um, machine learning algorithms uh, for these purposes should uh, think of themselves as, uh, as social scientists. And that, that may um, help drive the, um, the, uh, the, the, the need the, the drive understanding of the need to make value-laden judgments about accuracy. And I want to thank you all and thank also my, uh, my two wonderful students, uh, Yasmin Haddad and uh, Lubo Retrovic, uh, for their help and, and discussions surrounding this topic. Thank you very much. And sorry for going uh, over time. Oh, no, it was quite all right. I mean, it was a terrific talk. And uh, I think the, the points at the end that you got to are, are the ones that, that will generate some, some good discussion. So again, thank you for that. Um, we've got about 25 minutes for questions. Um, so you can use, feel free to use the raise hand function or you could message um, in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that and, and call on people. Um, just one small request, if you'd be willing to just introduce yourself and your uh, background when you uh, ask a question, that'd be great because we have folks from uh, all of our different units here. So um, with those caveats, we'll go ahead and, and open it up for, for questions. I'm happy to get it started. <laughs> oh, I, I, though I also saw Alexander put his hand up. So uh, I didn't put my hand up. So Alexander, why don't you go first and then I'll, I'll jump in. I just want Brand, to say it's amazing. I, I'm more than happy to go second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I, I have lots of different thoughts or questions that were prompted uh, by the talk, but first, thank, thanks for a very uh, provocative uh, talk that really resonated with us in the, the audience, and um, I really like that last point that you made as, as machine learning being a social science problem with elements of computer science and, and statistics or data science. I actually saw Jennifer Chase at the University of Toronto Data Science Institute, and uh, she's someone who set up uh, a new college at uh, Berkeley, effectively like a data science college, but which captures culture and, and humanities and, and statistics. And it's amazing seeing these other units like under, under this uh, sort of data science specific college. So, um, so one of the, the questions that immediately came up, because I was poking uh, Dirk uh, Steinke, who I, I, is no longer here, but he's, he's the one person from the Center for Biodiversity Genomics. Uh, in, in the audience, and oh, I see Stefan Schneider. There's a few people here who work with like um, identifying species, and I was thinking specifically like there's this, a, a a situation where you might have multiple measurements for an underlying target variable. So the case of um, you know species identification specifically, what we've got in this project are uh, DNA sequences and also visual information. So someone can identify a species through phenotype, but you also could identify it through its, its genotype. And these, so have you thought of the, the multimodal uh, manifestation of this issue? There's an underlying target that's something like it's true species, but even that is like a bit at debate um, in terms of those definitions. So that's, that's my question. Yeah, thanks very much, Graham. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, in fact, I've, I've written several articles on the importance of, of uh, robustness um, for, uh, for measurement. Although I, I wasn't talking specifically about classification, but um, I, I, I was talking more about uh, measurement in, on, on ratio and interval scales. But I think uh, the, the points I, were, I was making there uh, uh, apply equally. Um, so one, one important point, um, I didn't have time in this talk, but um, 
the way um, think think back to that clock. Um, uh, metrologists uh, put a, an uncertainty estimate on that clock. That's the um, the uncertainty associated with uh, predicting the ideal cesium frequency from the ticks of this particular clocks with all its imperfections. But how how can they know? that they got the uncertainty right, because they don't have any access to the ideal case. Uh, they only have access to that noisy clock uh, in their lab. And the way they do it is they build multiple clocks, they, they, and they compare them to each other. And each clock ticks at a different rate. Now, that's not by itself a problem. Uh, the fact that clocks tick at different rate doesn't mean that they're, that they're disagreeing, because what matters is not the ticks of the clock. What matters is uh, whether after correcting for each of their idiosyncratic individual uh, biases, after these corrections, you get a consistent um, estimate of the ideal case. And if, if, one, consist, if, if one ideal range for, for, the, for the duration of the second can predict the ticks of all these different clocks, then they're all accurate. Uh, with the with the uncertainty you uh, you provided them, so this shows you that uh, different different ways of measuring the same things are um, are not just uh, possible; they're in fact necessary to establish uh, the, the the accuracy of any individual method. Um, and uh, and that I think would apply to the genetic versus uh, you know phen phenotype based phenotype-based method of determining uh, uh, species. When you have a, um, a conflict in the, uh, in the classification, uh, when you know, one method tells you it's one kind of species and the other tells you it's a different one, um, the question is, um, can you account for the discrepancy in some way? Do you have a theory of how, of, of how each method um, deviates from the ideal classification so that you can um, you, you can explain the explain away the discrepancies and if you can they are they're both accurate um, under those corrections that's what I would say very cool and explains why we like ensembles in machine learning a lot as well yeah and exactly so yeah and and that that kind of I mean this this connects to the, the the crisis of reproducibility in machine learning, right? Why why are different machine learning um, uh, models giving inconsistent predictions? There are many many reasons for that. I'm not claiming that my my uh, uh, argument here is the reason for the lack of reproducibility, but I think it's a factor. Um, part of the problem of reproducibility in machine learning is due to the fact that different models. Um, uh, operationalize this, the same target variable differently. Uh, and in, instead of comparing the opera, oper, operationalizations, what we, what we need is to compare the target variables. Um, we need to correct for this gap between the operationalized target variable and the target variable under the ideal case. And once we do, um, then we can have a, a, a better idea of how, how much reproducibility crisis we have. It, perhaps some of it will go away uh, once we do that. Okay, great, thanks. So um, Alex, I saw you're next. And so just because I'm curious and we have history, tell us where, where you are now and, uh, and then uh, on to your question. Yes, so I'm, I'm currently at the Edinburgh Futures Institute and started my PhD two days ago. Um, also working a lot of on Aaron, Aaron's work and Marcel Bauman's work on measurement and looking at how that might be tied into some of the work on the ethics of AI that my other supervisors are working upon. Um, so, and because of that, I've been following Aaron's work for the past months and every time I'm hearing his talks to get more and more elaborate and complete the picture and more interesting also. So I'm very, very curious about um, a lot of the things that you were only able to touch upon, but probably have a much deeper and richer um, story or meaning behind it. Um, but the one question I have, and that's going off of the work of Marcel Baumanns on measurement and the social sciences, is precisely what you described as this kind of mechanical objectivity um, that is the label matching precision that some machine learning developers approach their applications with. And my question would be, 
and as you mentioned, the the obvious kind of cure for that is bringing more expert and um, expert judgment and opinion on it, and triangulation methods, and um, to arrive not only at precision but also at accuracy. Um, I wonder. So, if I look at the field sciences and how it's done, expert judgment and opinion can uh, come in at very different stages. For instance, when it comes to the input um, observations, when it comes to the model itself, or the evaluation of the model. And because some machine learning applications and uh, machine learning models are notoriously obscure and difficult to decipher, I wonder if you have an opinion of how we might think differently of how we can apply that expert judgment and how also the experts might have to interact with machine learning developers to kind of better understand, as you just recently said, how the machine learning model operationalizes the target value, because that's not as easy to discover as it would be with more gray box or um, white box um, models. I hope your question makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And and thanks very much, Alex. Uh, it's, it's nice to actually uh, talk to you finally because we've been emailing uh, for a while um so i'm 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 uh, a lot of my work is inspired by marcel bauman's work and you you probably saw his book was one of the books i showed on one of the earlier slides uh, uh, science outside the laboratory where he talks about uh, how calibration can can be can, can be achieved um in in field science where the the phenomenon is not under our control um um, uh, but we still want to have a handle of, of the uncertainty. And, and, and a lot of machine learning as it's currently practiced is a kind of field science. Uh, you, have, you have the data, um, you, you have uh, a general idea of how your machine learning algorithm learns, um, but you don't have, you often have a problem of transparency. The, the details are opaque. And then you 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 implement it, and um, you don't know in advance how uh, how actors will respond to it. So that's also a kind of uh, an an opaque part of of machine learning. Um, you know how will how will doctors use uh, or or decision makers at the hospital how will they use this algorithm? Um, the there are there are different points of intervention when you want to in increase the fairness or accuracy of, a, of an algorithm. Uh, they're often divided into three um, uh, pre-processing. So before, before the, the algorithm learns, you, you process the data. You can implement a kind of constraint on the learning in training, and you can implement it in post-processing um, once the predictions are, are out. Um, all, all these cases are uh, can be understood under Bauman's um, um, conception of a gray box model, where it's it's essentially a black box, but you have a, an idea of, of what might happen there. Um, but that uh, that doesn't mean that you're completely lacking in insight into into the dynamics. Um, for example. Um, um, there are randomized control trials of, uh, um, of, of physicians that are, where physicians are, are given text that describes a patient and they're asked to produce a preliminary diagnosis or, or to assess the risk of this uh, hypothetical patient. Uh, this is a black box procedure. Uh, we don't know exactly how how these doctors get at their at their uh, judgments, but you can use the results of of, uh, of a randomized control like that control trial like that to assess the magnitude of the gender bias around uh, diagnosis of heart disease. And as long as you have that number, you can use you can use a number like that to correct the predictions of a machine learning algorithm either in pre-processing or during training or in post-processing. Um, so the fact that you don't have a complete kind of white box type insight into each of the processes going on in the, in the model doesn't mean that you can't intervene to correct it, is, is my understanding. Hey, great, thanks. So um, next in the queue is uh, Andrew Bailey from the Dean's Office and Department of Philosophy. 
yeah, absolutely. I was going to introduce myself, but but now there's no need. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, speaking for the from the philosophy department. This so um, as a result, this may be a, a somewhat more technically unsophisticated unsophisticated question than some of the other ones you've been getting, Aaron. But but I really really uh, appreciated your talk. I really enjoyed it, um, and I, it made me think about. Um, uh, this this idea that the target variable um, has to be an ideal. We're, we're talking about something that's that's true under counterfactual conditions. Obviously, there's a lot of normative sort of value laden complications around that, which are interesting to think about. Um, but in terms of the trade off with accuracy, one thing I was thinking about was um, a situation where um, uh, the world isn't the way we want it to be. Right. So we we so uh, you know heart disease is one kind of case, but suppose we were thinking about an expert system that was trying to to assist judges in making parole decisions. Um, suppose we uh, uh, did a very good job of of trying to get that system to give us give us fair and accurate decisions about people who are actually likely to reoffend. But suppose that you know the way things are, uh, people with blue hair are are more likely to reoffend. But that's a contingent fact of other unfair structures built into our society. And that's a way that we would prefer it not to be, right? Um, so uh, is that a mismatch between, um, I mean, if we were to seek that latter kind of fairness, I guess my question is, do we then diverge from accuracy in order to try and um, approach the, the deeper level of fairness? Or is that just not the, the job of the machine learning system in these kinds of cases? Oh, good. That's that's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad you're, you're raising the, um, the criminal justice uh, example, because I think, yes, my, my argument applies there too. Uh, there are more complications, um, um, but, but the general idea applies equally. Um, and, and it's easy to, to think about it if you think about the difference between um, arrests and, uh, and, and uh, re offenses, re so uh, uh, repeated offenses or, or, or recidivism. Right, um, a lot of the algorithms that present themselves as, as recidivism risk prediction tools uh, predict something else. They operationalize recidivism as this other variable that they do have access to in the in the data. Um, uh, that's usually either either an arrest or a conviction or some other uh, interaction with the, with a with a a law enforcement or or or, or justice system, um, and this is exactly um, one of the causes for racial bias in many of these algorithms. Um, some, uh, if 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 and 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 it's uh, uh, established well that uh, some racial minorities are targeted by police in a disproportional way, um, your your you have a you will have an, an, an ingrained racial bias uh, in your algorithm if you try to predict recidivism from things like arrests and convictions. Um, but this is exactly the type of of, uh, of discrepancy that I think is an accuracy problem. It's not just a fairness problem; it's an accuracy problem because what you should be delivering to the judge, if you should be delivering to the judge anything at all, this is an argument about whether whether recidivism risk should be, you know, part of the part of the decision making of, of judges at all, machine learning or not. But put that aside. If you're to present uh, recidivism recidivism risk uh, predictions to a judge, um, you should uh, you should not just tell them how accurate your uh, your algorithm is in predicting arrests and convictions, because that's not what they actually want. Or at least I hope if they thought about it, they realized that that's that's what actually what actually they want. They want to know if someone is likely to reoffend, not whether someone is likely to be arrested or convicted, but whether they're likely to, to reoffend. And to be able to correct this difference, you need uh, real hard data about the rate uh, at 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 which, uh, say, uh, black people get. Um, get arrested uh, versus versus whites for example mm -hmm. um, that's that's an example of, of how you could correct this, this but, gap. I mean, so it, i think it, the kind it, the same yeah. logic applies it, i mean if you don't mind me following just quickly right the, my, my thought was that um absolutely there's a lot of room to to bring accuracy and fairness into alignment with respect to recidivism right so so um it might be that 
uh, certain kinds of feature um, uh, uh, are, are a bad full way of operationalizing that. But then let's suppose we, we are accurate with respect to that, but nevertheless, because of, let's say, systemic racism in society, uh, certain uh, groups do reoffend more often, right? So it in fact is accurate to say, yes, there are, there are high risk for recidivism, but, but that's contingent, right? That's morally arbitrary and actually in a, in a deeper sense, morally unfair. So now should we be do, doing something to, to um, have our systems address Good. that problem? And that's exactly the kind of further complication that, um, that I, want to, uh, I want to make clear that still remains. Um, machine learning is not going to solve systemic racism. It's not going to remove uh, structural uh, social problems from, uh, 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 from society. Uh, and, 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 and we would be, I think, naive to expect it to. Uh, yeah. um, and part of, and, and it could be that when you, uh, when you uh, try to, um, to very carefully define your, your target variable, you realize that I need to, you realize that you need to idealize society to, um, um, to, a, to a point where, uh, where it's completely different than, this, than the society that we have today. Right? And I think that's, your, that's really your point, if I understand correctly. Um, we need to idealize it so much, uh, the target variable then becomes, will someone reoffend in a perfectly equal society, in a perfect just society? Right? Will this person reoffend in a perfectly just society? Um, you, could, uh, you could say, okay, I'm going to try to gather as much information and use as much um, ethical theory, political theory to make that inference, or you could uh, conclude that there is no way to, to be able to make this prediction, in which case you shouldn't do it at all. You should find other grounds for, um, for, for making parole decisions or bail decisions. That, yeah. That's at least what I would say. Thank you so much. Thanks for the follow-up. That, that, was, that was really helpful. Yeah. Great, thanks. So, um, Stefan, I think you're, you're next. Hello, my name is Stefan. I'm from the Biodiversity Institute at the University of Guelph. Um, my, my question is much more general. Um, in machine learning, we, we tend to try and fit a continuous world into discrete space. And I just wonder from a metrology point of view, what do you think are some of the consequences of that or some of the, some of the biases associated with it or even some of the solutions that could help us? So for example, in the heart disease example, it's binary, yes or no, but we know there's obviously gradients to the degree of heart disease and the 50-50 case kind of gets lost on the margins. So yeah, just maybe elaborating on that. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question about measurement in general. Um, what information do you lose when you switch from, uh, say, an interval or, or ratio scale to, uh, to an ordinal or nominal scale? Um, the in in terms of uh, of the what's called the representational theory of measurement, you're bound to lose information. But in, in terms of the uh, of decision making, the question is always whether that information is important to the decision. Uh, whether the information you lost when you switched from um, from a, a continuous measure of the diameter of a blood vessel to a uh, you know, a zero or one for a, for a diagnosis, whether that information was um, was relevant to the decision maker. Um, the the answer, my answer at least, is that there is no uh, one general uh, answer that would that would uh, fit all contexts. Uh, it really depends on the kind of decision that you're that you're making. Um, Part of the question has to do with thresholds. Where do you set th the, the threshold that is um, in a way that is appropriate um, for your decision? And that's a matter of values. Um, if, if you care more about eliminating false positives than the false negatives, you, you'd set your threshold in a, in a different place, right? Um, but even beyond uh, the threshold itself, there's, uh, there's the question of the uncertainty around the value. 
what if it's exactly 50%? Uh, there's some, some uncertainty in measuring the diameter of blood vessels. Uh, on, what, on what side does, does this uncertainty uh, uh, fall? That, that's something we don't have uh, direct access to in our data. Um, there is, in fact, an entire sub-discipline of metrology called legal metrology that deals exactly with, with this transition from uh, continuous uncertainty uh, curves or, or more generally probability distribution functions to set thresholds for decision. Uh, so if you, the, the full answer would be go study legal metrology. Uh, what they do is that they take into account um, uh, the, the, the bounds of, of your, the, the thresholds for your decision making, and depending on what you care more about, such as false or uh, false negatives uh, or false positives, what you care about eliminating more, uh, they would they would give you the safe a safety margin that uh, includes the the majority of the of the uh, uh, uncertainty uh, density in in your function, uh, and it's it's a surprisingly precise calculation. Uh, so, if you want to know know more about how that's done, um, look look up legal metrology. Uh, it, it's interesting because I don't think the principles of legal metrology have been applied for machine learning classifiers. Uh, and this is, I think, another completely different, but another way that machine learning could learn from metrology is is by uh, by thinking about uh, risk and uncertainty uh, through the lens of legal metrology. So, thank you for for this question. All right, so I know there's more questions and I don't have my cesium fountain here and I'm not sure about my uncertainty with the time, but I'm pretty sure it is 1.30 and so that we should wrap up so, so that folks who, who do have to go um, can. So uh, on behalf of everyone at Cary Iron, I wanna thank you, just a terrific and uh, really informative talk that I know will generate lots of discussion here. So we wanna thank you again for your, your time for coming and thanks for a great talk. Thank you uh, for everyone for attending. And you're, if you had a question that you didn't get to ask, uh, please feel free to email me. Thanks, everyone, again.